Hey everyone, Jake here from CVP. IBC 2022 has come to a close and there have been some awesome announcements and releases. And in this video, we'll be covering all of them. So grab a coffee, get comfy, and let's get into it. Zcam haven't released a new camera in a good couple of years. So it's great to finally see a new addition to their line, the E2 F6 Pro. This camera builds on the already great F6, adding more features that people have been shouting for from Zcam. The most obvious addition is the five inch touchscreen monitor, which comes with the Pro as standard, but is not backwards compatible with the rest of their camera series. This is a good addition, but I've got to say, I really don't like the design of the way it's plugged into the top of the camera. This isn't a regular HDMI apparently, but the config on this early prototype looks like it's going to be super easy to damage. I understand design limitations, but this cable should not only use a right angle connector, but also be as low profile as possible. The camera also has a good improved set of inputs and outputs at the rear, with the biggest addition being a 12G SDI output, as well as a BNC for Genlock and timecode. The 12G SDI also looks like a low latency feed, which is a great improvement over the laggy HDMI of the previous Zcam flagships. You might have also noticed that this new camera also uses VLOC batteries instead of MPF, which was used on the previous cameras. This will be a welcome change by many. It features the same full frame sensor as the F6, but processing and cooling has improved. However, acquisition resolutions and frame rates have not changed over the original F6. The camera will also be able to output ProRes RAW as well as B-RAW externally, which is great as Z-RAW is a bit difficult to work with compared to these codecs. As the previous generation, it uses the same CFOS2 media, though the camera we looked at had some kind of weird adapter or caddy system in it too. Maybe this means you'll be able to choose between different media types. It comes with a locking EF mount as standard, but PL, Leica M and MFT are all also available. So essentially, it's a reworked F6 aimed at giving users a better shooting experience, but whether there is any improvement to the image, we'll have to see. Canon released a good amount of new products, starting with their new CN8 Cine Servo lens. This new lens is an update to the very popular CN7, which was released all the way back in 2014, which over the years has become a very popular lens because of its performance, size, range, and design. This new lens has a focal range of 15 to 120 millimeters, which is a two millimeter difference compared to the CN7. And that doesn't sound like much, but at this wide of a focal length, it is. The CN8 also features a 1.5 times extender built in, which will turn the lens into a 22.5 to 180 mm T4.4 to 5.9, which can cover full frame. This is similar to the CN10 that was released a couple of years back now, and does make the lens a lot more versatile. The lens does have a variable aperture from 15 to 95 mm, it is T2.95. From there, it will then ramp up to T3.95. It also has a macro function similar to other ENG style broadcast lenses on the market. It has a decent spec, features the same server unit as the CN7, but it has gained roughly a kilogram of weight over the CN7, which is a bit of a shame, but not too surprising given the range added. At release, the price is actually very close to what the CN7 was back when it was released. However, compared to the CN7 and other lenses like it now, it does look expensive, but hopefully we get to see improved optical performance for the extra cash. We are really looking forward to getting this one to test ASAP. Up next for Canon was their newest expansion module for the C300 Mark III and C500 Mark II, the EU V3. This module is aimed at being a more broadcast or live production orientated one for this system. It has a range of different inputs and outputs, such as SDI return, RS-42, Ethernet, and a 12 pin for connecting compatible lenses. Alongside this new module, Canon also released some new firmware to help improve the camera's use with this new module, as well as some other cool features. This includes XC protocol support, improved autofocus in 100 or 120p, four channel audio display, and support for camera to cloud. Canon have also released a series of new camcorders and PTZ systems. Starting with the camcorders, Canon have released five in total, consisting of the XA60 and 65, as well as the XA70 and 75. These four camcorders share very similar specs across the board, such as 4K recording, dual XLR inputs, and UVC streaming, but there are some differences between them. The XA60 and 65 feature two third inch sensors, whereas the 70 and 75 have one inch sensors. The five variants of each camcorder feature a 3G SDI port, whereas the zero variants just offer HDMI only. The 70 and 75 also offer dual pixel autofocus with face tracking, 5-axis stabilization, and a 15x optical zoom. 
The fifth camcorder was the Legria HFG70, which is a more prosumer focused camera. It features a two third inch sensor, UHD recording, a 20 times optical zoom and USB streaming. Next is Canon's new CR-N700 PTZ system. This uses a one inch 4K sensor and Digic DV7 processor and also has Canon's excellent dual pixel autofocus. It has a 15 times optical zoom, has a good range of streaming protocols such as NDI-HX and a range of IOs such as 12G STI, Genlock and Dual XLR. Lastly, Canon released the DP-V2730, a new 27 inch 4K UHD LCD reference monitor capable of outputting 1000 nits peak brightness, local dimming and a solid range of production inputs and outputs. It features a range of grading and monitoring tools, so it should slide straight into existing post and production workflows. Fuji have released the X-H2, which is the higher resolution, slightly more affordable brother of the 2S. It has a very similar feature set to the X-H2S, but instead of the 26 megapixel sensor in the 2S, it has a 40 megapixel backside illuminated X-Trans sensor. The X-H2's larger resolution sensor allows for the camera to capture 8K internally, as well as externally. You can also record 6.2K in the X-H2, which is downsampled from 8K, but is limited to 16x9, not 3x2, like you can with the X-H2S. It can also shoot ProRes internally, and it has very similar features to the X-H2S, but at roughly £500 less. It could be a really good option for people who would rather the higher resolution sensor over the 2S. With this, they also released the 56mm f1.2 X mount, as well as a 20-35mm f4 for the GFX line. The 56mm is a new version of the already existing lens, but with a range of key improvements like close focusing distance, improved resolving power, and hopefully fast autofocus motors. We will be releasing our video on the X-H2S soon, so let us know down below if you have any questions about it or the X-H2. SmallHD have released their latest range of 5-inch touchscreen monitors, Smart 5 series, and this is something that people have been waiting for, so it's great to finally see them. There have only been a small handful of 5-inch SDI monitors on the market for a while now, so it's great to see SmallHD release three. This new line consists of the Indy, Cine and Ultra 5. The Indy 5 is the most affordable with the Ultra being the most expensive. They are all 5-inch 1080p 4210-bit panels housed in an aluminium unibody chassis with a mix of two 3G SDIs and two HDMI 2.0 ports for input and output and can be powered via 2-pin. They do have different peak brightness though. The Ultra is 3000 nits, the Cine is 2000 nits and the Indy is 1000 nits. They all feature a touchscreen but they can all be controlled slightly differently. The Indy is only controlled via its touchscreen. The Cine also has a side mounted joystick and a back button, and the Ultra has an array of front facing physical buttons. This will make the Ultra really great to operate with gloves on and more consistently. It should also save you from getting fingerprints all over your screen. These monitors can all control cameras as well, but which cameras will depend on the monitor. All three can control red cameras with the correct cable and the Ultra can control ARRI and Sony Venice cameras via Ethernet. They also all feature SmallHD's latest Page OS 5, which is actually available to download now for some existing SmallHD monitors. Teradek have also released a range of new TX and RXs, and this includes TX and RX versions of the Ultra. So let's take a look at those new Teradek releases now. Teradek have released the Bolt 6 series, a new zero delay wireless video system, which uses the six gigahertz wireless standard. At release, they are available in a range of different units and configurations and feature a range of improvements. They supposedly run quieter and are cooler as well as lighter than the previous Bolt 4K generation. This new 6 GHz range will open up 12 new channels, which means that you should have much less interference than 5 GHz. But not every region has opened up the 6 GHz range yet, so make sure to check your region to see if you can use it. A good connection is crucial for these systems. So this is the necessary step to help give productions the most reliable signal possible. They are cross compatible with the entire Bolt 4K BB3 ecosystem and will connect via 5 GHz with these older systems. They also feature new modes such as an SDI eye pattern tool and long range mode. There will be three different versions depending on the feature set you need. Like we mentioned earlier, there will be 5 inch Small HD Ultra monitors with these built in but there will also be monitor modules released for SmallHD Smart 7 series of monitors as well. Pricing and pre-ordering are open now on our website, link to which is in the description below. Sony had a few new things at the show to show off. First off was the FR7, which we looked at when they announced it earlier this month. 
Long story short, it's essentially an FX6 combined with a PTZ system. This makes it an incredibly unique option on the market as it takes the FX6's excellent image quality and low light performance and combines it with Sony's PTZ control system. You can check out our full review here if you want to learn more. Sony also showed off their updated Rialto system for the Venice 2, as well as new firmware for it as well. The new Rialto is very similar in design to the old one, but with the increased horsepower needed for the increased data the Venice 2 captures. It is now available with two cable lengths, 3 or 12 meters, and has four configurable buttons on the body over the original Rialto's 2. Alongside this, Sony also released version 2.0 firmware for the Venice 2, which should be available early next year. This will bring several new recording formats. As well as this, there will be a range of smaller updates, which you can see on screen now. This includes updating the sync in the camera to help improve the functionality in virtual production workflows. We've been toying with the idea of doing some content around the Venice 2. So if you want us to, let us know in the comments below. Panasonic have announced two new camcorders, as well as an 18mm to their L-mount series of prime lenses. The HCX2 and the HCX20 both feature the same 4K 1-inch sensor and are aimed at replacing the HCX1 cameras. The X2 is the more expensive out of them, as it features a 3G SDI out, Ethernet port, timecode in and out, and dual codec recording. However, they pretty much share the rest of their key specification. They can both capture 4K 60p, feature 20 times optical zooms, a new high brightness monitor, integrated wireless, five axis hybrid IS, and a bunch of physical and software features that make shooting with the camcorder great. Otherwise, image quality should be the same as the previous HCX1. It's purely usability and streaming updates that are key here. Panasonic also announced their latest lens in their affordable L series of primes the Lumix S 18mm f1.8. This now means that the set consists of an 18, 24, 35, 50 and 85, all at f1.8. They were all relatively compact and light, cover full frame and are decently affordable. This is now a pretty good complete set for anyone who owns an S series camera wanting affordable prime lenses. KinoFlow have introduced the Mimic VR, a full spectrum light designed for virtual production. This is essentially a 600 by 1200 millimeter panel with a 10mm pixel pitch that can extrapolate data from video and output bright, accurate light to help produce better light for VR productions. Not only is it a full spectrum light, whereas most LED walls are RGB, but it's also much brighter than conventional LED wall, has a high refresh rate, is 16 bit to support HDR, and is brand agnostic, so it will work with existing volumes. KinoFlow have also announced that they are developing their own video wall panels, which have a 1.9 pitch. We'll be talking about virtual production more and more over the next few months, so if you want us to cover anything in particular, let us know in the comments. There have been a bunch of new lenses announced, so let's quickly take a look at some of our favourites. Just before IBC, Atlas announced their latest series of anamorphic lenses, the Mercuries. These new lenses are full frame, front mounted 1.5x anamorphic lenses. They are aimed at being a mix of vintage tones and modern mechanics. Atlas have done a fantastic job at keeping the size and weight of these lenses down considering their coverage and anamorphic design. 1.5 times may not give you quite the same exaggerated anamorphic look as anamorphics with a two times stretch, but for full frame formats, 1.5 is excellent. At release, six lenses have been announced, with the 36, 42 and 72 mm being the first three to ship out of them. They will have an aperture of around T2.2 and have decent close focuses considering that they are anamorphic. They have a much warmer vintage tone and feel to them than the Orion series, which is nice as I prefer anamorphics with a subtler flair than the original series had. They are also priced really well at just around £5,600 per lens, which compared to other high-end full-frame anamorphic lenses is really impressive. I cannot wait to get these into tests, so make sure to subscribe ready for when we get our hands on them. Sigma have been a bit quiet recently when it comes to their cinema lens lineup, but at IBC they've released the 65mm T1.5 which is going to be in both their high speed and classic line of cinema lenses. And this is the 11th focal length in each set now. This is the first focal length out of the entire cinema lens lineup that has been developed from the ground up just for cinema use. It's available in EF, PL and Sony E-mount, has a rated image circle of 43.3mm, front diameter of 95mm, a close focus of 65cm and a 9 blade aperture so it will fit straight into existing sets of Sigma Cine glass. They have also teased that an X-mount 18-50 f2.8 DCDN will be coming, which could be a really great combo 
for the latest XH cameras from Fuji. With this, they also announced that you can now finally buy classic series primes separate from each other. This might now make them slightly more popular, as previously, you were limited to buying them bundled together, which did limit how many people wanted to buy into this set of lenses. They certainly do have a really pronounced look to them, which will limit their user base. But let us know if you'd like to see some footage from some in the comments below. Lights were showing off their new Hugo series of lenses, and at launch, this set will consist of seven focal lengths. A 21, 24, 28, 35, 50, 75, and 90 millimeters, all of which are T1.5, apart from the 50 millimeter, which is T1. There will also be an 18 and 135 millimeter coming soon. These lenses have been influenced by Leica's M series of primes, but have obviously been reworked for cinema. But optically, they should have a very similar look to the M's. Pricing wise, a seven lens set will be roughly 107,000 euros. They will be available in LPL, L and M mount, with LPL probably being the choice for most people investing into these. They have a rated image circle of 43.3 millimeters and the housing themselves looks just as excellent as you'd expect from a lights lens with consistent gear placements, focus rotations and front diameters across the set. This will make them much better to use than the cine versions of the M series lenses, but of course at a higher price tag. One thing I am intrigued to see is how close a set of these will match, as this is something to consider when buying a set of Leica M's, as they can differ color wise lens to lens. Fingers crossed we get these in to test ASAP, as they look gorgeous from what we've seen. Samyang have announced their latest series of lenses, the VAF series, which they are touting as the world's first set of Cine AF lenses. They have been designed for full frame E mount cameras and consists of a 20, 24, 35, 45, and 75 mm, all of which are T1.9. One thing I was a bit surprised with was the addition of a tally lamp inside the lenses. I've never seen this before, and it's pretty weird, but could be cool maybe? The focus rotation is pretty long at 300 degrees, and you should be able to use focus motors on the barrel of the lens, but there are no focus markings. These decisions, plus their low weight, makes me think that they have been pretty much designed for use by smaller crews or on a gimbal or drone. There are some kind of electronics and mounting system at the front of the lens, which Samyang have said offer some upcoming accessories, but they haven't told us anything about them yet. These are intriguing lenses and could be a good option for own operators who often use a gimbal, but until we get our mitts on them to test, it's hard to say. DZO teased their retro series of primes a while back on social media, and they actually had them at the show. The silver housing makes it very clear that these are definitely very different to the existing Vespid series of primes. They have different coatings to the Vespids, which results in a more vintage vibe than the original Vespid primes. The flare looks very similar to other reduced coating lenses that I have seen, like the Blackwings and Doolens. I hope to get these in to test ASAP, as they looked really nice from what we saw on the show floor. Siri was showing off their 35 and 100mm T2.9 1.6x full frame anamorphic lenses, as well as their new 1.25x anamorphic adapter. This now brings their full frame 1.6x prime set to four focal lengths, with the already released 50 and 75mm. They are all available in four mirrorless mounts, RF, L, E, and Z mount. These can all be used with their new 1.25x adapter, which will mount directly to the front of the lens, bringing them close to a two times squeeze factor. However, there are limitations to it. You'll have to move it from lens to lens as you shoot, and the 35 mm won't cover full frame, and it is also adding more weight to your rig. It can be mounted onto any lens, but the look will be more subtle. It is single focus, so you'll need to make sure your lens is set to infinity for you to hit your sharps. I'm intrigued to see how this performs, and with all the budget anamorphics on the market now, whether this is a solution people are going to take to. Crosial had their new meta mount for Sony E-mount cameras on the Sony stand, and it's quite a simple product, but there is nothing else really like it. This new mount adapts Sony E-mount to take PL lenses, while providing electronic contacts that will allow for metadata to pass through and lens control. This is definitely aimed at FX6 or 9 users wanting to use PL mount ENG style zooms that want control of their lens and metadata, which for certain productions is crucial. This pass-through will allow the camera to record your cinema lens's metadata, like focus distance or focal length, using either LDS or Cook Eye data, which this mount has both of. It will also allow you to control your lens's focus, iris, and zoom via the 12 pin on the side of the mount. It is expensive, but I think it is going to be popular for camera operators using the FX9 in a more broadcast environment 
as there is nothing else like it, and it solves an issue people have wanted to fix for a while now. Right, let's get into some quick fire honorable mentions. Links to details about these are in the description below. Abonair showed off their AB512 wireless video system. Adger released their new Colorbox high-end converter for colored managed workflows. Atomos released AtomOS 10.82 for the Ninja 5 and 5 Plus with their Connect module or Shogun Connect, which adds Facebook Live and custom RTMP functions. Ari had the RIA1 radio interface adapter on display from their Hi5 ecosystem. Blackmagic have announced four new Ultimap 12 models, which look like a really powerful set of keyers and real-time composite processors, as well as an update to their Hyperdeck. Corswix announced the Mac Q4 MBI B-mount charger. DJI announced an incredibly detailed firmware update for the Ronin 4D. Fomex announced the FC600 and 1200 RGBWW flexible LED panels. Hollyland released the Mars 4K wireless video system and M1 monitor. Insta360 announced the X3, their latest dual lens system that uses a half inch sensor. Irix have announced a reworked 150mm with a lesser close focus than the original macro and teased a new lightweight matte box system. Light Panels released their new series of Studio X LED Fresnel fixtures. Movi have released their new SL4 batteries for the Movi Pro and Carbon. Nanlux has announced the Evoke 1200B, a 1200W bicolor LED spotlight. Ovide announced the Coco, which is their new 10-inch monitor recorder. This looks really interesting, actually. Tamron announced the 50-400mm f4.5-6.3 zoom lens for full-frame E-mount cameras. Tilter released a new version of their rear operating control handle for the RS2 and RS3 Pro. Ready Rig showed off a new string attachment for their system. Samsung released the 990 Pro NVMe SSD. Smallrig showed off their new universal rotating NATO side handle. Swit have announced their latest series of B-mount batteries alongside a range of hot swap and conversion plates. And lastly, Vaxis released a new set of filters for the Tilter Mirage matte box, Pearl Aura in three different strengths. While we were editing this video, a few other things got released. Sony also released details about their version 4.0 firmware for the FX9, which will be available in October of this year. When the camera released a range of bolt-on rods, Axum released mountain brackets for the CineView and CineEye. Zcam also announced a new range of LED light panels, the Zolar series. From the spec that I've seen of these, they could be pretty good at their price point. We should be getting them into test as soon as possible. Let us know what your favourite announcement from IBC 2022 was in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching.